All right. Thank you for coming out tonight, folks. I'd like to call to order the uh, board work session for August 16th. Um, if everybody please stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, a few announcements regarding a couple of executive sessions. Uh, there was an executive session of the board on August 2nd of this year for matters of contract negotiations with MEA and for a matter involving administrative employee. There was an executive session of the Finance Committee on August 9th for matters of contract negotiations with the MEA, Teamsters, and the Methacton uh, support professionals. Uh, in terms of attendance, we are missing uh, Paul Winters, Jim Phillips. Jim Phillips, and Herb Roth. And if you want to scoot down, you're more than welcome to. Okay. You two keep your distance then, I guess. All right. Um, moving right along, we got the recognition of guests and scheduled speakers, Doug. Mr. President, I want you to know that prior to this meeting, we held a uh, property committee meeting. In that property committee meeting, it was moved that uh, the matter of facilities prioritization be considered uh, again by the full board. And this evening, um, we would like to be able to uh, bring forward Phil Leinbach from AEM, uh, who uh, submitted the proposal for facilities prioritization uh, that was previously uh, voted not to proceed by the board at the last voting meeting. Uh, the document that I have for all board members are, are, is the document that we provided uh, for the board at that voting meeting. So this evening, um, we would like uh, Mr. Leinbach to come forward and to explain the proposal and then to allow for the members uh, here at the work session to ask any questions uh, as they desire. Mr. Leinbach? Um, before he proceeds, I just wanted to say it was voted on and we voted not to move ahead with it, but you know, certain members of the committee uh, feel that it would be worthwhile hearing more commentary about it and to give it more thought. So that's why we're revisiting it. It's a, it's a big document. There's a lot of work there. So I, I'd rather have us rehash it again and bring it for another vote uh, and educate all the uh, board members more thoroughly so they, they have more information to make their, their vote on. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening and uh, I'll try to be brief. I know you've got a long agenda in front of you. Uh, the proposal that you have in front of you is basically to build upon the document that we provided that was a facility assessment report. It's essentially trying to take the facts and figures that are in there and boil it down into a spreadsheet. Um, I know it's kind of a simplistic explanation, but it's actually going to be a very intensive spreadsheet uh, to put this together the way that we've proposed. Um, there is an executive summary in the document, but that looks at things on a priority, I think, of, of zero to five years, five to ten years, and ten to fifteen or ten to twenty years and beyond. So there, there is, it, it's not that there isn't a summarization in, in the assessment that you have, but this is trying to wrap the uh, arms around the more critical components that are in that study, put that in a spreadsheet, and look at it f with a, a, a more precise prioritization. And of course, that would be done by individual facility. Would Each individual facility would have its own prioritization. We wouldn't try to put everything on one sheet for the entire district. That would just be too confusing. Then for each facility, we look at five areas, codes and life safety, infrastructure, maintenance, capital improvements, and enhancements to break those things apart in different categories because they're going to be viewed by different parts of your educational process as having different impacts, certainly. Then for each of those, breaking them. May I ask them, you a question yes, related sir. to that? So, I mean, obviously anything that has codes and life safety is the top priority. Is there any... Uh, logical order to the rest of those categories in terms of ranking them from priority perspective? Uh, codes and life safety in some instances will be more of a priority, but infrastructure, we're looking at 
major systems of the building, your mechanical systems, your structural system, your envelope, and that's where a lot of your challenges are with your envelope, your roof. And I've always, you know, people ask me, well, what's the most important part of the building to take care of? Well, if you've got a problem at your roof, it's just going to trickle down and affect everything else that you do until you take care of leaks and those types of things. So, you know, the envelope I look at is a component of infrastructure. So there may be things that are more important in one aspect in codes and life safety, but because of a condition, an age system somewhere else, the infrastructure may be more critical. Um, maintenance things are things that normally would be part of uh, a maintenance program, but maybe have been ignored for some time or have become less important and that now have become critical. Um, capital improvements, obviously, that's looking down the line of uh, really, you know, reconfiguring a building. You know, talked about two, two facilities really have some major needs, you know. Is that going to be a critical uh, component? We'll probably touch on it, but that's not really the focus of this report. Then enhancements are just that. They're not things that are necessary, but we've addressed them in here. Where do they fit? Most of those will probably be a five-year plus thing. So given what the, the component is in each of these five categories, some may, may certainly be more critical. Life safety, a lot of things are grandfathered. Until you touch it, you don't have to bring it up to code. But like accessibility, the charge was put out in 93, I believe, to make your facilities accessible. We still have things since 1993, and you're not alone, a lot of places that have never been made accessible. There was no definitive timeline, so it's just basically now if you touch it, you need to make it accessible. Or in some cases, you may look at that and say, we really need to make this component of this facility accessible. We can't continue like this, and it may have a higher priority versus something else that we'll deal with that the next time we do a major project. Okay? Then we're going to look at the categories level one through four, and that just has to do with the time factor of when it should be done. A, a one is zero to 12 months, basically an immediate need, whereas you work out to a four, anything five years and beyond. I won't drag down into that. That's pretty self-explanatory. And then it was touched on uh, at the end. If you were here, you caught us talking about the interdependent items. There are masonry issues up on the walls above the roof but I don't want to go and replace the roof and then come back in three years and have a mason working up there with scaffolding and everything else uh, doing masonry repairs. It would make sense to do that project all at the same time. It may drive the cost up, but it's going to be a sensible approach to deal with that with those interdependent components together. As we mentioned, HVAC, if you're going to replace rooftop equipment, put it down, replace it, new curbs all at the same time that you deal with your roof. Another question yes. based on that comment. and so. When you talk about something that's independent, so masonry is really kind of independent of roof, is that clearly identified in the report or does that take some level of understanding and knowledge of building structure to say we need to, it really makes yeah. sense to connect these two together? The shortcomings are certainly identified and there's probably some reference to that, but that comes back to a professional expertise. I think Mr. Fretz certainly would have that and probably some of you on the board that have knowledge of facilities, but not necessarily anybody's going to, you know, well, I need to replace my roof, let's get the roof replaced and not think about masonry. You may be taking leaks through your masonry wall just as much, if not more, in some areas uh, than you are with roofing systems. So they kind of walk, work together as part of that building envelope and dealing with it together. Uh, deliverables, then, is the spreadsheet that we've been talking about. It will be a paper document, but then you would also get the actual Excel file in a usable format that becomes yours to use. Um, you know, we're not copywriting this thing that you can't touch it. We're providing you a document that hopefully will be usable for years to come and adjust over time as the needs and challenges of the district change. So that's a very quick approach. Another question was raised to about how much time. We're gauging somewhere around 100 hours. It may take more than that. We're locked in at that number. But, uh, uh, you know, that's what we've kind of looked at. It's probably around 100 hours to get this thing done. And that's principally about four different people working on that together. I've, I'm not the HVAC expert. I need them to pull their information and do, work with us on the prioritization. And we do have an interim review planned with administration to go over this so that it's not just AEM regurgitating what we think is important. We need your input. It's your district. I may find something that I think is really important, but you're going to explain to me why 
something else may be more important or be a level two versus a level one. So we're just not coming and dumping this thing on you blind that you have no input on it. We're looking to you to work with us to make sure that it's as accurate to how the district views it as possible, but certainly with our professional input as well from what we know about building codes, building systems, structure, and so forth. Does anybody have any questions for him while we have him here? Um, <clears throat> I already asked my questions earlier, but for the benefit of the rest of the board, I was just going to kind of re-ask and basically sum up what my understanding is of your response, and you can correct me if I'm misquoting you or misrepresenting it. Sure. Um, one of the questions that came up during our committee meeting was, um, whether or not this type of a report is something that's typically done as part of a facilities assessment. And the answer um, that, that Phil gave us was no, it's not something that's typically done. Um, one of the things that necessitates this is that we have so much that has um, piled up in Methacton with the, the age of our facilities, with everything being kind of constructed in the same time period. And so we have this mass of, of stuff that needs to be dealt with and um, and so that is part of why we would need this type of a, a, a summary and, and distillation of the information. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that um, Phil I had asked earlier or you had mentioned earlier that this was your perspective and it doesn't consider things like our financial situation and district specific components, um, things that we need to take into consideration which I think you alluded to also right. here but um, just wanted to reiterate that. Um, I don't have any further questions since you answered them, you know, not 45 minutes ago, so thank you. That's generally what we had discussed. Obviously, I can't get inside your, fine. I'm not a financial expert, so we're providing you a document that hopefully your, you and your financial people can then evaluate, but uh, we're focused on, you know, building issues, obviously. Um, just a couple quick questions. Uh, during the property meeting, Mr. Dorn had mentioned the AIA coding, and is that included in this or not? We, we will, I didn't note it specifically in here, and simply what that is, it's specification, uh, the construction specifications that we create, they have, there's two systems, up to a division 16, and then there's up to a division 30. We use the division 30, it's newer, but basically it looks at, you look at division three, that's typically concrete products, four is masonry, five is steel, and steel related. So we'll get that hierarchy so you can do a sort and say, you know, look at your dollar items and say, wow, we've got a lot in division seven, which you will because of roofing systems and so forth. So that wording change would be added to the proposal in front of us for no additional charge? No added cost. That that was agreed upon. It's not noted in here, but we, we are committed. We will do that, certainly. Okay. I've made a note on my copy already. Okay. Do we currently own the PDF of the document that we have? I was going through my mind. I'm pretty certain we sent that down to Mr. White Leather. If we haven't gotten it down here, we certainly will. Do you recall if that was sent down? Okay. But we do. We yeah, should. It, it was a requirement. The, I'm, I'm certain it's sent down, but I'm not going to. Okay. Quick question to the property committee. Has this report been marked final yet? No. It's okay. in draft form still. Okay. So I would... The expectation is that um, we need to go through this work and then make a formal presentation to the board about, you know, the magnitude of it. I think the board's been provided copies of... Everybody got copies yeah. of it um, so they could see it, but we're keeping it in draft form until we um, kind of f finish up with some of the risk liability things. Okay. Yeah, if you look at the executive summary at the end, it's fairly broad. And to break it down with intricate detail, just we would regurgitated the whole document again. So this is basically saying take that executive summary, give it more detail, put it in a spreadsheet form, and, and prioritize that executive summary with further input so that you've got something a little bit more manageable and sensible versus seeing a big number and not knowing what all is included in that specifically. Okay, just a couple quick more. Sure. Um, since this was voted upon last month, um, it originally had a deliverable date of October 8th. Now that we're behind a month, can we assume that that would be pushed back as well? Correct. Okay. We're obviously working on other things, so to pick it back up, I'd be looking at working on this in the month of September, 
and delivering it for your October property committee meeting, assuming that it probably happens around the same time, first week or two of the month. Okay, um, and in the report, there's you know, pretty detailed line items on the summary page for each one where it lists you know what needs to be done. In the spreadsheet, is there any further breakdown of these items? Like say it says carpet replacement. Are all of these things going to remain the same or is there going to be a further breakdown of what's already listed in the summary page? They will probably remain as they are unless they become specific to a building like Skyview Arcola where you've got really two facilities and one if there's some overlapping things that we need to break down and say this is really an Arcola piece or a Skyview piece in that regard because I think what will get really confusing is if the numbers don't match up when I look back at the text and say, well, what happened to my $10,000 item? How did it become $90,000? So I, I, I want to try to keep that consistency between the spreadsheet and the document so that when you look at it, you understand where they come from. Okay, so for the most part, it should remain. Yeah. The, the only thing we talked about, and again, I apologize if you weren't here, it's not in our proposal, but we talked about including an inflationary line item. Yes. So if that goes out to year five and we're adding at one and a half percent per year for inflation, that number obviously will increase, but that will be at the bottom of the column or off on the right somewhere so that you'll still see the original number and then the inflationary impact on that. Okay, and very last question is in, in this document, uh, for each particular item, you know, you list the, the time frame, which is zero to five, five to 10, mm -hmm. 10 plus currently. Um, but for certain ones, the word immediately is used. Can we assume that the ones that, you know, list the word immediately would be the ones that would be in that zero to 12 Correct. month time frame? Correct. Okay, right. Um, so my last question actually then goes back to Dr. Zerby. Um, being that we did have this in April, are any of the zero to 12 month items included in this school year's budget? I, I can't answer that at this point in time. I, okay. I, I, okay, if you could, if you could follow up with that. Yeah, because uh, while, while we, we certainly have plans uh, for doing uh, certain capital improvements and we know that there's certain things that um, we are, uh, we have, we, we have budgeted. The, the issue is uh, our goal was taking this document as a, a procedural matter uh, th through a finalization from a draft copy. So to tell you exactly, I, I, I don't know this inside out. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that and, right and, and the only reason I'm asking that is just to see if, you know, because we have, we're, we're in, you know, 16, 17. The idea is, you know, if it's listed as zero to 12 months, I'm just trying to get an idea of, so that's really going to mean the 17, 18 school year as nothing has been completed during the current year that we, that we know of. Okay. Some miscellaneous maintenance stuff, but none of okay. I, none of the maintenance. There's there's probably a, uh, like, there's probably a few items that they're viewing as a priority that our school district already viewed as a priority, and probably laid into this year's budget. But I don't. They probably didn't take the document review and and do that. But I I think just by coincidence of knowing what what are the most urgent things, there might be some overlap. Certainly. And I, I know, Mark, as we walked around, some things were pointed out that were issues at the time, and Mark's already taken those on, in hand and has started to address some of those items, so they may fall off, or maybe there's maintenance done to carry us through until we can address the full problem. So um, I don't want to give the sense that if it's in here, it's been ignored. Some of those things have been addressed already. I know we haven't worked with it, but in talking to Mark, he's been working on some of those. Yes. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. We talked a little bit about the draft compared to the final report. Will the final report look like the draft? Just have more in executive summary or in summary details? Will it be that huge it's, document? It's still this document with the addition of an electronic file that we will also then provide you a printout of that spreadsheet. So. I still get lost. 12 or 13 facilities, there'll be 12 or 13 spreadsheets for each of the facilities, but you'll have that electronic file. But that's, those spreadsheets will go along as an addendum to this. Okay, but the spreadsheets are the new project, are they not? Okay, but the final report 
uh, w could be issued without doing this new project? What the district is looking for at this time is looking for more prioritization than what we've provided. Again, I explained kind of three levels. I think that we have that zero to five, five to ten. Right. This is breaking that down even further and creating other prioritizations and other categorizations. So it's a greater level of detail of that information. It doesn't change what's in this document. It just is putting that in a more definable format with greater specificity to what uh, determines a greater priority for one thing over another. Where I may have said, you know, we've got zero to five year things. Some of those might push off the, after we sit with the district and they say, you know what, let's put that as a level four, it's on the cusp, you know, of a five year, where those immediate items that you've noted are gonna be in that level one in all likelihood unless they've been addressed already. So the bones of what that document's going to look like exist in here, it's a matter of translating that into an electronic format and into a spreadsheet. That, but that's the new project, correct. the spreadsheet, okay. That is correct. So, so if we did not do the new project, what would the final report be? This is a completion of the first phase of the proposal that we have done. The, the facilities assessment, we've completed that and we've handed that to the district. The district has looked at it and has determined that they need more information before they use this as a document to promulgate facilities projects. I think okay. that's a fair way to say that. It would look like this document. That's what the final the report. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Th this that's does not change. Yes. That's what I'm asking. Okay. So um, another question I have is that um, I think we're someplace not too far from $100 million as a total in this project. We're around there. Yeah. So you've done projects like this before. What kind of history do you have as to how close your estimates come? Say we were doing something within the next year. Um, do you have a, a track record of how good your estimates are? We've had some that we've hit it right on, some we've been high, and some we've been low. There are factors at any given time. Uh, I could give you an estimate tonight that could hold out and be very accurate till next summer. All I need is one change in oil to go back up to $120 a barrel, and suddenly the cost of asphalt, delivered goods, and everything else goes up with it, and there's just no way to project. If I start projecting for those types of inflationary impacts, I'm gonna give you numbers so big that heads would explode, and that's not fair. And so as best we can do, and I think we explain, we feel we're accurate within 10 or 15% given what we know about the market today. And if I could be more accurate than that, I'd have a big job somewhere else making a lot more money, probably would have retired by now, because <laughs> okay. this is what we bang our heads against the wall with. So we try to be as accurate as possible. Um, superintendent that we worked with in the past, he said, you know what, you really don't know your budget until you bring your bids in. And that's really what it boils down to. We, we give you our best professional guess, mm -hmm. but there are so many, fa I, the number might be right, but it might get two bidders for a contract because they're busy on something else and that drives the number up. Mm -hmm. I can get 20 bidders and suddenly it drives the number down because I've got so much competition and somebody's hungry and needs the work and we come in under it. There's so many factors of the bidding process, market economy, pricing that all we can do is say we give you our best professional estimate with what we know at the time of the study. Okay, and you feel that you're pretty on target based on history? I've had some good ones and I've had some bad okay. ones. I'm, I am okay. human and all right. I'd like to say they're all perfect, but okay. they're not. Okay, okay. Um, and, and the other thing, uh, in listening to your conversation earlier uh, and the um, discussion about how the staff would use the report and how your staff is involved in designing it at this point, how extensively will our staff be involved in uh, communicating to you how uh, such a report would be most useful to them to work with. Um, do you see them having a lot of input into, particularly Mr. Fretz, having a lot of input into how you structure the report? We already had a meeting to review this document and talk about what the district needs beyond that. Mr. Fretz was in that meeting along with Mr. Dorn and Dr. Zerbe. And so that's what this proposal is driven from of 
how can administration use this report better? How do we extract the information so that they can use it for what Mark needs to maintain facilities, what administration needs to do to figure out how we're going to finance these things and how we're going to pay for them. So that's what the body of our proposal is formulated around. And our plan is to develop this to a certain point, not finalize it, and sit down with administration again, take a look at it and say, does this look like what we talked about? What do we need to adjust and make sure that we're going in the right direction? I don't want to go you know, 500 miles in the wrong direction and have to recorrect and redo the thing. So there will be an input again midstream of this process before we complete those spreadsheets and bring them back uh, to the board here. Okay, but there's already been that conversation sure. with staff. The initial okay. conversation. I don't think it will change drastically, but I'm sure there are things that we're going to say, can we do this a little bit different? And we certainly will adjust and, you know, again, tailor this to Methacton. Okay. This is, this is your spreadsheet, not ours. Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments from me, and I, I think Phil hit on this, but I, I think the key factors here are, are you know, three or four, right? So the granularization of the information into these zero to 12, one to three to help us really populate our capital budget planning model um, is important. I think, you know, understanding the dependencies and, and really these categories of, you know, maintenance, life safety, I call it life safety slash risk infrastructure, um, you know, and then how do those things drop down into prioritization. Um, obviously, those are all critical. And then, you know, by doing, and some of you might have been here during the meeting, but by making sure we tie it to the AIA categories, it allows us not to make spot bids, right? So buy one roof and then next year buy one roof and next year buy one roof, but kind of look at it and say, well, if I buy two now and one next year, can I get a, you know, a price hold, you know, for the duration or whatever the particular buy might be, which may help us hedge some of the inflationary things that we just don't know um, across the industry. Um, so I, I, I do think those are critical items that can help us, you know, not get in this mess again as a school district because quite frankly you know it's just been too many things that have been left for a number of reasons uh, unattended and and it only causes um, you know more more money to be spent um, long term um, I think the other thing that Phil talked about and mentioned to the board was the fact that you know he'll have you know, a structural guy uh, an electrical guy an HVAC guy they're all helping build this workbook so it's not as if Mark has all of those skill sets in his house uh, his staff his house within his team to help build the workbook so I think there's a tremendous amount of value there I think one other thing Phil that we talked about towards the end was you had a very extensive photo library and you've agreed, I think, to provide us a set of disks by building of that photo library. So, so we'll get that sorted view of, you know, what do you have, a couple thousand photos that show the details behind the report, which I think will be beneficial long term uh, from a board and, a, and a, a property committee perspective, and obviously for Mr. Fretz as well. Um, and that's all. All right. Thank Thank you very much for you know answering all the questions and sharing more information. Thank you. Um, and thank you for everybody for asking your questions. I think one one thing we're going to have to think about, and it, it will kind of be depending on how the the really the revote of this goes in the meeting is you know how what is our strategy for disseminating information around the report and all that. So you know if if the vote changes and it, we go ahead with that, now we're saying sometime in October we'll get that data information and we have this information sitting there. Does it make sense to wait till we get that and bring it all together and disseminate that information? Or, you know, if we decide to disseminate a part or all the report, you know, in the near future, how do we go about that? So we'll just need to uh, play this out over the the next few weeks, I think, and see how best to get that, that information disseminated. Yeah, Mike.
Sorry, just one follow-up for Dr. Zerbe. Um, can we, as a board, have the PDF document once it's located so that we don't have to lug this around? It'd be much easier to re reference a PDF to be able to search features. <laughs> thank you. Good, thank you. I think. Yep. Uh, just for just for uh, uh, the sake of making sure that we have everything in order, um, if we are bringing this before uh, a vote uh, next week, is that the is that the intent uh, going forward? Yeah. Okay. And then the next thing that I will do is I will ask Mr. Leinbach to revise the document so that it does reflect the deliverable dates and uh, reflects the. Uh, uh, the inflationary uh, factor and the AIA codes and the photo library. Okay, thank you very much. Next on the agenda, we have uh, with us this evening uh, Mr. Robert Schock uh, with the transportation update. Um, if the board would be so kind to take their seats in the front row, we have a presentation. And there is a, a hard copy of that presentation at your seat. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. How do you Look. <coughs> yeah, I think we'll get on that. <coughs> okay. Uh, good evening. I think this is the fourth time I've been uh, in front of uh, the entire board or at committee over the last 10 months. Uh, at this point, we're three weeks from opening school, and I wanted to just fill you in on where we are. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, a number of drivers expressed interest in testing the routes as we had proposed in the PowerPoint. And so they started right after that and took the route sheets and marked them for the times it took to drive that entire route. While doing that, they also brought any local knowledge of congestion, impassable roads, uh, door side stops, and so forth. Uh, we asked them to pause at those stops to simulate actually loading of the students. Then we turned that information over to a very experienced router with the Bus Boss software. That router took every one of those comments and incorporated them into calibration of the map. This is a computer map, much like uh, Google Maps or the maps in your navigation systems or GPSs in, in cars. So what that means is that calibration can be set at the travel time by road segment by time of day. For example, one segment might travel 15 miles an hour between 7 and 8 in the morning, but then during the more congested rush hour, it would slow to 10 there would be impassable road segments. So in a matter of seconds, you can say this road cannot be driven by uh, buses of this size. Then we calibrated the times by adding uh, 18 seconds per rider. So if you have 50 students on a bus, that would add 15 minutes of loading time to the driving time. Now let me talk about the importance of the using the latest maps, because as these software systems have developed, the uh, mapping capabilities have become more accurate. So what that means is that the software can take into account whatever you uh, ca calibrate that map and do in a matter of seconds uh, what it would have taken someone by hand to uh, hours to do. And when it's doing that, it's aware of the seating capacity you've set and all the road system considerations. And the software is set to minimize the amount of time it takes to transport that number of students to the school. Now, at this time, uh, now that we've had all of the students uh, that have been entered into the system as of noontime last Monday, we are saving on average about 20% of the ride time, meaning all students on average will be shorter by about 20%, meaning these maps are much more efficient. Uh, the mapping of the stops to the routes. Now what that means is last year you had 18 buses that ran only one tier. At this time as we're finalizing it we will have 
one or two buses only running one tier, meaning you're paying the same amount for that bus, you're getting better use from it. And it's all dependent on more efficient routing and that 20% reduction of time. One of the big issues for the drivers has been that previously the turn-by-turn -turn directions, take a right on this street and travel 500 feet to the first stop, continue on that street for another quarter of a mile, those driving directions were not accurate. And that was largely fixed in a matter of minutes by saying this is an impassable road, the computer must f go another direction. So those routes uh, will be fixed, but I need to say that uh, this will be about a year-long project involving the drivers to fully calibrate the map, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But better calibration means we can respond to changes more quickly. So as I said, we had the latest information as of last Monday. Uh, they were all added to routes that had been previously drafted, and that would have taken uh, many days previously. And that was a data transfer from the student information system into Bus Boss. Now, just today, we had 46 changes, and that's been, amount that, uh, that's been about what we've had every day in the last week, and that's enough to fill a bus, and those are several withdrawals, many address changes, and some new students. So routing is always a, is a work in progress, but it's important that you can do it rapidly in order to get those students, uh, some of which have to be provided bus service within a certain a period of time due to special ed regulations. What we've been trying to do now is reduce any long ride times. The committee uh, set at a recommended time, a desired time of no student riding longer than 50 minutes within the district. These are the public students within the district boundaries. And when we look at that, we calculate uh, what you're going to see now. We're calculating how many students for Eagleville are riding z five to 10 minutes, 11 to 15, 16 to 30, 21 to 25, and so forth. This is by grade level. So this would be, in this case, 16 students in the second graded yellow riding 16 to 20 minutes. So we always concentrate out here what, uh, how many students, what grade level might have long rides. Is there anything we can do with them? We've currently completed uh, the morning public runs. As we complete the non-public here, uh, most likely to be done pretty well tomorrow, we will then use the non-public buses and special ed buses that may be returning from a previous trip to address some of these things that are long ride times for younger students. And that's been the practice in the past in the district. So that's Eagleville, here's Worcester, a uh, little different pattern. Most of the students are below 25 minutes. Uh, some, uh, because of the long distances, are out in that area <coughs> up to 45 minutes. This is Arrowhead, a uh, little tighter, shorter times, grade by grade uh, again. So the PM kindergarten we would have a little concern about. We would look at that route in gray here with some of the longer runs. Now, it is important to note, though, that that is uh, probably three students, and this is probably two students. So we're talking a small number of students that we're going to attempt to improve their ride time. Audubon, Skyview, two grade levels, most of them under 35 minutes a few that need to be adjusted. That, that's a single student, that's three students. Arcola, and all grade levels at the high school combined. So in this case, the bulk of the students are below 35 minutes, with a few longer ones at f above 50 minutes. So as we complete the routing, we're watching this. We're also watching the scattergrams that we provided last time where we looked at how much of the seating capacity and how much of the time available was being used. Now, one of the things we've uh, done is we've talked to people, including the administrators and drivers, about various issues. I've already talked about the driving directions causing confusion because the map had not been calibrated. Uh, and that's particularly a problem with substitute drivers. So this, the fix of that that we will develop, working again over the next couple months with drivers, will greatly improve that issue. Special ed routing takes too long from providing the data to getting the routes. 
We looked at that with the special ed staff, our, the technology staff, and the bus boss experts, and have determined three possible fixes for that, which would take what took weeks this summer and make that into something that only takes hours. And that's all through the way that the data is transferred and handing it off to someone very familiar with the routing uh, capabilities of the software. Another thing we're dealing with is uh, apparently there was some unclear and contradictory communication in the past. We're setting up a call center. There will be frequently asked questions, uh, prescribed answers. I will be sitting there with two people with headsets and we will be uh, answering calls for the last two weeks of summer and the, probably the first two weeks of school, then it'll be shut down. Uh, for any rider or confusion in the first week, that can happen for a variety of reasons. We're going to do what's been done in the district in the past, have some standby buses positioned around the district so we get on the radio, just call them and say pick up so and so and take them to this school. So a lot of other improvement possibilities here. Uh, we do have the Zonar, which is a GPS tracking system that we can confirm the times that the buses are uh, out there, how fast they're traveling, how long they're at each stop, and so forth. That can be used to calibrate. Uh, we're looking at issues related to the work study students, special ed students going out into the community and doing work, athletic events, a couple of issues around that. How are we handling uh, late arrival communication if a bus is known to be late? Uh, we've set up the software to do that electronically th through the school messenger, bus by bus, so they can call the parents with electronically on such and such a bus and say that's going to arrive late. Uh, and they set up about a th 15 minute threshold. A couple issues around the use of the bus video that we're addressing. Now, transportation is, is complex. I think you probably have a sense of it, but. I'm used to having very detailed processes, and you're going to see an example in a minute, but uh, in fact, you know, I had a procedure manual for transportation uh, uh, in the past. It covered all these areas and more. This is good being totally customized, uh, working with your administrative and transportation staff, and first student has their own policies and procedures very well documented. So these are the sorts of things just giving you some idea of the complexity beyond the routing complexity. At this point, we're focusing on communication. We've talked to the administrators, we'll talk to the drivers tomorrow about the key messages. Uh, the average ride time is critical, safety is always first on our mind. Uh, there has been widespread agreement that this amount of extensive rerouting was really necessary. As we've talked to the experienced uh, drivers, the past routers and dispatchers, there's been, uh, and the administrators, it's really time to do this. The neighborhoods have changed, there are different land development patterns, different road networks, turning lanes where there hadn't been in the past and things like that. So it's really time to do this. We've worked closely with this advisory committee, just had our third meeting last week. They talked about every uh, factor uh, that affects the use of the seat and capacity the ride time, the balance loads, we followed their uh, guidance, I believe, very directly. Uh, it's important to note, we're really using the latest and most sophisticated software, but we are very aware that we need to have the local input. What we're trying to do this year, then, is to take all that local driver input and f force it into the map calibration so we don't lose it from one year to the next. Uh, as this starts up, we will be monitoring uh, things like the uh, on-time delivery and any other factors in the early weeks and we'll be reporting daily to the administration. Uh, now it's important to note when we communicate to people that the first week it takes a little bit to settle down as parents are taking pictures of their student getting on the bus and things like that and just as everyone's getting used to it. So as we've tightened up the minutes, we have to really be careful to uh, be watching uh, what we do. We don't want to add minutes back into slow by slow dismissal practices or other things. So we're meeting with every principal at their building and talking about that uh, next week. Letters to parents will go out about August 22nd uh, to be delivered in the next few days. Let me just talk about the communication. And you know, we have radios. Always have had radios. Uh, we have automated messenger, as I've talked about, but the call center is new. So it starts uh, next week. Training is this Friday. 
two operators with handsets. They'll have access to the bus boss information. I'll be in the room. Answers will be standardized, and we're looking for a 24-hour response time. So let me just show you this uh, this flowchart diagram. So the the transportation call comes in generally from a parent, but it could also come from the school or the bus contractor. And so those calls come in, and they are of they're entered into the system. We have a, a networked database that we're entering the calls, and then depending on that call, different actions occur. It's important to note that. Uh, I will be making decisions on those, uh, and in some cases I will probably involve uh, the superintendent or others in those kind of decisions. And then depending on the decision, we notify the parent, and we have to take several days to notify the, the school, the bus contractor, and everyone else. So this is the kind of approach to documenting the processes that uh, we're using in uh, a couple dozen processes that relate to transportation. So here's the next month. Uh, completing the routes, training the call center, uh, you can read through it, uh, but it's a busy time, uh, can't lose a day. I wanted to point out specifically, uh, at the board meeting uh, next week, we want you to approve the routes, but we don't want to just hand you 300 pages with stop locations and times and all of that. What we're looking to give you is the kind of data that you've seen in the past. The scattergram, these bar charts showing the times, uh, the number of buses per school before and after uh, last year, this year, how well we're using the seating capacity, how well we're tiering the buses and so forth. Uh, and then school starts in three weeks from today. Uh, we will take about a week in making decisions before we implement any significant changes uh, because we you know, will want to be sure the system has settled in before we implement changes in the second week of school. So I think that should be about it. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, let's go back to the seat for, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Schock, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we, we anticipate, uh, my conversation with Mr. Schock, we anticipate having uh, those documents that will be on the agenda for your approval uh, next Tuesday available uh, uh, likely by, uh, by Friday of, of this week. That's our, that's our intent. Um, certainly, as, as you may understand, that uh, you know we're continuing to you know provide updates and work with uh, first student to make sure that these are as uh, as complete and as accurate as possible. Are there any questions for Mr. Shock at this point in time? Um, I have one quick one. I'm sure other people have more, but last time, and thank you by the way um, for everything. Um, last time there was the mention of uh, changing the number of buses um, and that's not mentioned here so Correct. I I'm okay. curious where we are with that okay what we've done is uh, we have been trying to meet the general parameters and bringing buses in if we were ha into the system adding them in if necessary uh, we will be uh, pretty significantly below last year's number of buses as we finally roll this out. The situation is the afternoon has tighter bell times. So we know how the morning is. The question is how many buses do we need to add to the morning number to get those afternoon routes home uh, from the high school to the intermediate school and so forth in time. Because you've taken a 30 minute window and collapsed it to 10. So we have to Will we get the information at the next meeting? Yes, okay. you'll have it at that point. Because we're waiting to try to use as many of these non-public buses as possible to meet the needs of those six buses. So the non-publics are still being worked out today and tomorrow, and then we will look at whether we have that possibility. And we also wanted to address some of these longer ride times uh, to determine uh, 
you know, if we can address those with a special ed bus that might be driving through there or a, a non-public bus that is on its way back from the school. I said I had one. I lied just because due to that answer. It mentioned here that there's a three-day three day, uh, required to implement, I guess, any changes due to a problem that's not a one-time thing. So uh, does that mean? OK, what that means is if a bus is arriving late to school one day, uh, we will record the arrival times every day for every bus. Uh, but we would, because of traffic congestion, maybe an accident, uh, road construction, we would like to see a pattern for three days before we're going to say we need to notify all 60 kids on that bus that they need to come to their stop three or four minutes earlier. Okay. And then last time there was concerns about a little bit about overcrowding. So when we hear less buses, we get worried hearing that. And maybe it's due to the rerouting, and I'll, I'll put that in your hands. But there was also significant concern it seemed like with Skyview, for example, um, has that been addressed in the last two weeks? Yes, yeah, let me uh, talk about both of those. Uh, first of all, the buses are very well balanced, and we are within those uh, parameters of seating capacity that were set. So uh, you do have some very long runs from the northeastern corner of the district down to the other corner for Skyview. Uh, what we're looking at there is, let's say you've got five students who are on over 50 minutes. The question for us is, if we want to take another bus out of the garage, cost of $50,000 approximately, how much time could we save? You know, that's the very specific question. So for those five students, can we get them to school instead of 55, can we get them 45 minutes? And it's, it's that specific when you are addressing it. And then you have to weigh it. To save those five kids, you know, 10 minutes a day all year long, is that worth 50,000? That's the, that's the level of questions that, you know, we can pose to you. And if you decide you want to do that, uh, you know, that can be done. But we don't want to do that until we've used all of our other options to try to address those issues. I probably just have uh, one question, and that has to do with the number of children in the seats. I know you were talking last time about elementary schools having three right. children. The, the to manufacturer a seat. says a 38 inch seat can fit three people. We know that's not the case for secondary kids or even seventh and eighth graders. Once with the elementary level, we say two and a half, and then we, and knowing that some seats will have three, some will have two. Now, what we try to do is be sure that we don't have that at full capacity too many minutes from the school. So if you're at that two and a half capacity for three or four minutes from the school, that might be all right. But if you're on that bus at that full capacity 15 minutes from the school, that's probably too many and we should reduce the number. And that's something you'll keep calculating yes. as time goes by. Thank yes, you. So we're watching it that specifically. And the, the router is extremely impressive in terms of her uh, conscientiousness of d dealing with all the door side only stops that you had in the past, keeping kids at the same stop, uh, and watching those kind of factors uh, so that we're not creating any difficulties. Now, if we decide we need to fix something like that, maybe too many kids for that 15 minute period, then we have not hesitated bringing another bus into the system, even though we know it's, it's the cost of it, because we, we're, we're very uh, concerned about overloads like that. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for including the ride times for the students. That that information was definitely needed. A um, couple questions I have is: you mentioned that the drivers have been testing the routes. Do we have a percentage of, that have been tested? You know, if we have all, X, all routes have been tested. All of the routes that we had uh, a month ago. Now, with all the changes of, of students that have come in and out, we uh, had to we've had to make revisions. And in addition, those drivers. Uh, testing sheets would indicate maybe a certain congestion area that had to be addressed and then there were adjustments from that. But the purpose of that uh, exercise a month ago was to be sure that we had the travel speed times and the loading times accurate so that we were putting out accurate times from the start of the school year. We didn't want to be 10 percent too optimistic and then find we're going to have to add a lot of buses in the first week of school. So 
They were all tested uh, by different drivers and uh, all of that information. Every comment on every sheet was incorporated into the decision making. Okay. Um, and I believe this was mentioned before, but the scattergrams, the, the, that will be part of the deliverable on? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, when we're talking about increasing the number of runs per bus, you know, last year we, there was a lot of buses that just did one run, right? Correct. Now we're increasing that to, you know, two runs per bus. Is there any concern that you'll be late to the second school? <laughs> if, yes. you, if you know what I'm saying, like what, how, how does that work right. out? So at this point in time, we believe we've built a cushion into the total amount of time with extending the number of seconds it takes every student to uh, load the bus. Now, that can be affected by traffic congestion that can vary from day to day. So what we will be doing if any buses are arriving late to the school is taking a very good look. We have the Zonar GPS tracking system. We'll see where what happened, what section of road it was, uh, whether that was just, and we'll talk to the driver, was there an accident that day? Was there particularly heavy congestion? Do we need to adjust it yet or do you want to drive it a few more days before we make an adjustment? That's okay. the level. So we bring the driver in and have a good conversation. We've got the GPS data we're looking at at the same time. Okay, and I would hope just from personal experience that there's a little fluff added in there from the yes. time that they arrive at the one school because, you know, kids misbehave, the bus driver or the principal is coming out and speaking to those kids for a while. You know, it's not good. The kids are just filing off the bus and then, you know, the bus drives away. There are circumstances where that's not the case sometimes. Um, for the automated messenger, um, has that been, for lack of a better word, fixed? Yes. I, know, I know in the past that that call has not gone out that that bus is going to be 15 minutes late. Sometimes it will. Sometimes it won't, but has that? Well, they've linked it to uh, the Bus Boss software. So we, we're linked to the proper database in Bus Boss. Now, the automated messenger, uh, I believe they trigger it at a 15 minute lateness, uh, and that's, you know, adjustable. Yeah, that is a manual process. So that means that um, if a driver determines that they're going to be uh, 15 minutes later or more, it's, it's communicated to the dispatchers, dispatchers commu communicate it to the transportation uh, person for the district, the dis that th there's a flow chart associated with it, and then it goes to uh, Ms. Lynch, uh, who does the communication out. So it's not, it's not well automated. Okay. <laughs> So the automated messenger is not so automated. <laughs> well, it is, it, it is automated yeah. in terms of it's connected uh, with, so for example, we're able to, if we know with the bus number, um, it's a matter of taking a, a, a predetermined, uh, a predefined message, dropping it onto that bus, and then it does communicate with all those families. But for, it's not like the dispatcher hits a button and then the communication goes out. Okay. Um, it does go through a chain. It's a, it's a district system, not necessarily a system that, that's managed by uh, first student. Okay. Uh, you, you briefly touched on the, the non-public buses. I know that that was one thing that was you know, kind of briefly talked about in the last one too, but that seemed to be the one where the ride time was a little bit longer than it Correct. was. Is that still the case or have we managed to we'll, try we'll to... We'll show you that uh, when we get all of that done in the next day or two. Okay. Uh, and there are you know, dozens of schools and different times depending on the distance to that school. Okay, and my last question actually is to Dr. Zerby. In terms of the vote for next week, um, have routes and stops been approved by the board in the past? Is this, a, is this a new best practices method that you're recommending? Or how, how, does, how does that work? You know, if the, board, if the board, and I'm not saying that this would happen, but if the board you know, would, would turn it down based off the data that we see next week, does that mean that kids aren't getting picked up? I mean, how, how does something like that work? <laughs> Because I, I mean, being having attended these meetings in the past, and I'm sure Brenda has been here. I mean, I don't re recall hearing the board vote on routes and stops. I, I think what uh, what's important, especially at this stage of the of the game, and what I mean by that is uh, because we have such uh, significant change, um, it is important that um, you're not addressing all the routes. Uh, meaning in terms of you're not approving the routes, you're approving the parameters for which the routes are based on and the, the data that we have available, for example, the ride times associated with it, um, more or less than, than actually looking at every route. I mean, this, it's, it's going to be large. And likely by the moment you vote on it and approve it, there's going to be 45 additional changes the, the next day. 
So, so really what we think is important uh, for the board to understand is not that you are voting on the routes, but the parameters associated with the routes and the general understanding that um, we're doing this work for this purpose. And that's where all those items generally come in that were listed in the sheet. So when we talk about, uh, we talk about uh, bus stops, bus stops, you know, we will have a listing of the bus stops. That is something that by school code you should uh, approve. Okay, and that's nothing we change. So that is the, the list that uh, you typically would do. And to your question earlier, have we done that in the past? And the answer is no. The next uh, item uh, is use of time, seating capacity. Those are the things that you'll receive from the, uh, the reports that will be shared with you. And those are the, those are the parameters that we're suggesting that um, the board approves. Okay, so along those lines, I would just ask that the resolution reflect what you would like the board to vote upon as opposed to, so I think it even says that we would vote on, you know, stops and routes and I would prefer if, if we're voting on the parameters that the resolution be worded that way. That that's, that's makes very good sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just have a couple. Um, um, first of all, thank you for this. This is very informative uh, from my perspective. Um, Early in the pitch, you talk about 20% of the students will have a shorter ride. What percentage of the students have longer rides? That 20% that is calculated on the total ride time of all routes in the morning. Yeah. And so we're saying that that total ride time is declined by 20%. Understood. So on average, the students will be 20% less. Now, in terms, uh, you know, some students are going to have longer rides than they have had in the past just because the routes are different. Uh, so, uh, do we you know do what not, that percentage is? No, we don't. That would require us to look at every student individually last year, how long they're on the bus, and every student this year. Okay. We're not at that level of detail. Okay. Yeah. Um, On the process page, you know, you, the process in, in a, is complex transportation system. I, you know, I, I look at these and there's probably other ones. These are probably your key ones. But the first question comes to mind is, who owns these? Okay. Now, do you own these? Does first student own them? Who, who will these own the processes and the process maps? Okay. Uh, the district will own the processes that are jointly developed by the administration and the transportation department. First student in their operations has their own set of processes for hiring and things that they handle. So, okay. But they bring expertise to this and they bring best practice from other uh, locations. So I'm uh, very excited about it in part because we're finding many Im potential improvements in technology and your technology staff is very sophisticated on this kind of logical and sequential processes. and so. I think between the technology staff for a student and uh, I, this work was done in a school district that used the International Standards Organization, ISO 9000, 500 procedures in all parts of the organization. Uh, last year I did a study for the Maryland legislature and of all of the transportation operations in Maryland and uh, we looked at very extensively at best practice in Montgomery County, Maryland, 250,000 students. They have 2,000 processes online, all linked to regulations and so forth. So I think we're going to be able to, and Dr. Zerbe and I were talking today, get a very sophisticated document around transportation, and that may give you a model of what you might do elsewhere, because we do have a lot of expertise uh, at the table at this time. So they don't, so all these processes don't necessarily exist now, they still either are under development or need development. They, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and when we do a process, uh, we have a, in a standardized format, what's the perp the title of that, the purpose, the owner of that process who has to make corrections to it, reissue and retrain people within 30 days, that's normally how these systems work. And then, all of the attached forms, the step-by-step, -step, who does what, when, how, that kind of thing. So when it's been revised, all that stuff. Yeah, revision okay. history. And I mean, I can share that with you if you wanted to, to no, see that. No, that's okay. That. I just, so. it, to me, it's needed. And I just, you know, sometimes you get words on a page and there's nothing behind it. Yeah. And so you answered it. Some exist, right. some don't. And there's a lot of work yeah. to develop some of this. 
So, and, but this would, uh, you know, talk about the distribution and the revision history. So anyone could come into this document and say, when, when was this revised and why? What problem were we trying to solve? That's, that's the level and, you know, I think once you get there, many of the issues that you faced in the past year uh, will be fixed. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to process the data much more accurately, much faster. You'll be able to communicate better. Uh, you'll have uh, and many other things we believe can be fixed. We've been looking at the root cause of some of the issues that have been raised and, and focusing on fixing that root cause and as we've been Well, raised. if you have data that backs it up, it, it helps a lot. Um, the letters that are going out the week of the 22nd, it sounds like they're going out by mail. Is that legally required or can we send them electronically? I'm thinking in two senses. Number one, it costs money to send them out, but it might be legally required. Number two, you know, it just might be more efficient for people to have them electronically if they need to look at them, parents. Certainly your, your question and your comments make sense. Uh, traditionally, we've uh, tried a multitude of different ways, uh, but we've seen to have the most success with mail. Uh, so putting it in the mail while it does bring a cost, that's where we have the most success with communicating with our parents. Would you do it both ways? Or is that too complicated? Uh, we're, we're, we're not on schedule to do it both ways. We, we've, uh, we've had a lot of discussions with the technology department and, and the use of our, our messenger systems and other ways to do this. Uh, the, the issue for us is the reliability of the email addresses that are provided to us. And we will have a hit and miss uh, a process and we learned that just recently by communicating out with our one-to-one -one program uh, so we, we we missed some key uh, people including one of the children who happens to be the son of a board member <laughs> but in the <laughs> I don't have any boys so it wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> but uh, understandable we, we we run into those issues and and, and certainly uh, you know there's no obligation on the parents side to keep those email addresses up to yes. date it, but we do work with them and communicate with them to do that on, on an annual basis and that wouldn't start until September when children come back to school so the best way for us to do that because we we know their residency uh, we know their their mailing address it's the most accurate way to communicate okay and last question for me it seems as if it would be beneficial at maybe our September board meeting after you've kind of run for about three weeks to come back and tell us mm -hmm. how we've done versus the targeted projections. Okay. I mean, I just <laughs> think that would be beneficial to see, you know, it, it has all this work that we've put into it yielded something. Sure. So. That's a good suggestion. Uh, are we okay with that from the board? Yeah, yeah good. absolutely, Thank you. especially after last year. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> It may have a lot less, much grayer hair by that point, I think. So you may not recognize me. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, everything that you've given us so far has been um, really comprehensive and very easily understandable. Um, one of the questions that, that came up for me, and this, the answer may be obvious and I'm just missing it, why is it always the kindergarten riders that are these outliers that are ending up with these 55 minute ride times? I know it's only a couple of students, but when they're a couple of the yeah. youngest students on for the longest time, that gives me pause and I'm just wondering why that is. Yes, we'll be checking. I'll have an answer next week. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the other question I had, I'm looking over my notes from last meeting and um, particularly the comments and feedback that we had gotten from some drivers that had spoken at the meeting. Um, one of the drivers had brought up the issue of the timeline of when the drivers get to see the runs and bid on the runs. I see that that's supposed to be happening this week. Is everything on target for... Well, no. Yeah, let me address that. <laughs> yeah. No. What we did uh, was, I think the other day, within the five-day requirement, we had uh, the AM routes, but the PM routes had not had this matching that I talked about, the six buses having to pull times off. So the, the drivers can look at the AM routes for the public and have a pretty good sense of where that is. And there will only be six buses that should have fewer students on them than the AM routes. In picking the PM routes, what they have to do is uh, those routes are still under development. They should be pretty much done by tomorrow. Uh, so the drivers have a meeting tomorrow. They pick by seniority starting Thursday. And so the, all of those routes have to be cleaned up by Thursday and, and issued. So we've been, uh, you know, 
pounding through that, we believe we met the contractual requirement of at least having some routes they could look at, but uh, it's not as good as we would have liked. Uh, I can certainly admit that, so. Okay. But they will be but, you know, by tomorrow. And you know, what you've got is the 46 changes in a day, so anything that we have is, uh, but the afternoon routes were not as good as they should have been. That's definitely the case. It, well, and I would think that some of those 46 changes are, in a day are, are probably par for the course this time of the year. Um, right. But it's, I guess, a complicating factor when you're making mm -hmm. changes at this level. Um, so I think that takes care of my questions. Thank you. So thanks for, you know, all the details you provided. So, you know, when I, when I look at this, it's kind of the same story as the facilities that we're now trying to address a lot of things that have been addressed for a long time, whether it's the facilities, whether it's the transportation routes. And it, it sounds like we have a good plan in place around the first week or so to help uh, get us through any rough spots of all this being introduced. Um, you know, one, one thing that's become pretty clear to me over the last month or two is the the amount of knowledge and expertise and first-hand experience all the bus drivers are going to have out there. So when we're talking about new procedures and policies and everything, how are, are we currently integrating into the longer-term plan, not just the first week or two, a good mechanism for bringing that knowledge and that information that's out there on the road back into the system throughout the school okay. year and having that feed into the day-to-day -day processes that we'll, we'll have in place. Uh, yes, what we're looking to do is at tomorrow's meeting with the drivers, lay out what types of input we need back from them to calibrate the map. That is the big project for the next few months. Uh, in doing that, any driver-related procedures can also be shared with the drivers, and there really needs to be a, a flow chart for that as well. You know, what do we want you to look at? What do we do when it comes back? They come back, we, we talk to them and get their input, and then we say, you know, we, this is good input, but it's not the highest priority. This will get dealt with a month from now. If, if they could bring back something that's very high priority, then we'll address it right away. So. That uh, really requires, you know, looking at what they're bringing back to us and then prioritizing the implementation. And if I could just add to that. Oh, um. Just one more question. It seems to me that maybe substitute drivers are, that, that may come on do, sometime during the year may add an additional complication to the smooth running of this. And do you have extra procedures to acquaint the substitute drivers with how the district runs its transportation and how what you're expecting of them? Uh, yes. I mean, one thing that you know is following the latest technology is. When a, when a substitute driver comes in with certain systems, you can have them sit at a screen and it'll give them the windshield view of that whole route. So, you know, they'll sit there for 15 minutes, see the windshield view, they'll be somewhat oriented to it, then they go out with the route sheet and so forth. There are also programmable GPSs that could have the voice talking them through the route. So, I drove 12 routes, not being very familiar with this, with this district, with the GPS, and the route sheet, I didn't get lost once because I was able to see that I'm turning right on Main Street. I can look at my GPS, there's Main Street. So, you know, there are some technology assist, uh, assist that we can do with the driver. So we're, we're talking with First Student about that. So technology can be very helpful there. The other thing is you can, you know, do something like add a photo to the route sheet. So here's the view of this stop. You know, there it is. That's what you should be looking at when you're at that stop. Because, you know, when the driver, go, the substitute goes out there, maybe the uh, house number is not on the mailbox or something. So that's, so there's a lot of things that First Student brings best practice from other organizations. So it's a good point. The substitutes are, you know, uh, uh, have the most difficult job and we need to do whatever we can do to make that work well. 
I just want to make one last comment regarding this process. Um, it's, it's quite evident uh, there's been a lot of moving parts in terms of uh, the, within the last month, uh, this has come to a critical mass. Uh, Mr. Shock has done a very good job, but I think what, what, what the, what's key to us bring, having this conversation today, even though it's not 100% perfect, uh, we'd like to be f further along with the PM routes and so forth. It's really a cooperation that we're receiving from first student. Um, I, I think they've really come to the table um, and, uh, and, and said, let's get this done. Uh, they, they recognize, as well as the drivers do, recognize how critical it is for us to restore uh, the faith back in our, our public uh, for the work that we do, because we know we do a good job. And we know our drivers have, have traditionally done a good job. We just had a difficult year last year, and we can't afford to do that again. And so I just, you know, I'll be at the uh, meeting tomorrow with the uh, with the drivers, and I'll be sharing them, sharing with them my uh, my thanks for for the work that they've done, as well as for the thanks that uh, first student has done to step forward to help us with this process. So uh, I can't uh, say enough about their cooperation. Uh, that ends the uh, items for recognition of uh, guests and scheduled speakers. There are no reports for this evening. Um, there will be a, an item for uh, public comment. Um, the board meeting minutes would be reflected in the meeting, and then we have fiscal items. Uh, there are, are several fiscal items for, in fact, a list of bills, a treasury reports, superintendent salary adjustment, and the student settlement agreement. Are there any questions on any of those four items uh, listed? I just have a comment on the board meeting minutes, which um, there are problems with the way the minutes come through. They don't finish the lines and so forth, and I'm just hoping that the regular minutes are complete, um, uh, except at the end of one page, or on page five, um, it ends in the middle of a sentence and it doesn't seem to pick up on the next page. I will take a look at that. Any, any other questions on uh, fiscal items? If not, we'll move on to personnel items. Uh, Mr. Harney, or Dr. Harney? Uh, yes, we've got quite a few, and there'll be quite a few added. I'll try to let you know and wonder what sections we're going to be adding uh, for next week, because as you can expect, this time of year is very hectic as far as our hiring. Um, we've got uh, under uh, resignation, separation agreement administrative, we have one item for your approval next week. We have one resignation professional. Um, that position, we believe, we have found a candidate for today, fortunately, because it was a late resignation, so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to fill that by tomorrow. Um, we've got five resignations classified. Uh, we have uh, eight employment professional, and as I said, there should be some additions to that now that we've hopefully found our French um, replacement. And we're also looking at adding uh, a first grade to Worcester. I want to call it to your attention. We have that listed as a, as a uh, placeholder right now for um, one instructor. That, that uh, it has been changed. Right? No, it hasn't been changed. That's at Worcester is where we need the position, but we've already got internal interest now. And I think some of you are aware of how that process works, where we have internal folks can move into positions. So the ultimate filling of that position with a new person is probably not going to be at Worcester. We've got to go through the internal processes first. So the um, position that we added at Worcester could be an internal um, contracted person that we already have on staff. So then, then we have to fill that position, post that position and fill it. So the ultimate filling of that position could be elsewhere from Worcester. But it's on there as a placeholder to recognize that it's a new position that was added for enrollment. We have um, nine employment classified. Um, the first two are, are, are basic um, replacement positions. We've got seven positions that Dr. Katona is going to talk to in her section of the presentation today. Uh, we have two change of status professional for your approval. We have four change of, of status classified. Um, there's some probable additions coming into that category again for next week. We have one supplemental contract for your approval for JV uh, boys soccer. We have one addition to our classified substitute list for custodians. Uh, I understand we will have a list uh, next week of volunteers to add to the uh, docket for next week as well. 
And we have two advisements of uh, folks moving. We will most assuredly have more of those under that category next week as well. Are there any questions from the board? Any of, the, any of those items? If not, we'll move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is curriculum and programs, uh, Dr. Katona. Okay, good evening. I just wanted to give you an indication of the uh, positions Dr. Harney had mentioned a moment ago. An increase in Title I funds uh, for MIFACT and for the 2016-17 school year allows us to extend our reach uh, to use these funds to, our, to include our COLA as one of our schools um, and to include math as well as reading as a focal point. Uh, as a result, this year we will focus on both math and reading at Eagleville, Woodland, and Arcola, the three schools in our district that will be receiving Title I funds. Uh, throughout the time we have been receiving these funds, it's become increasingly evident that putting the money into human resources is one of the best ways we can really use those funds. Um, that's how we really help our children improve. So to that end, this year we are seeking to hire the following positions with our Title I funds. At Eagleville, we would like to have an additional five-hour reading instructional aid, uh, as well as a five-hour math instructional aid. At Woodland, uh, we would add a three-hour reading instructional aid and a five-hour math instructional aid. Um, and at Arcola, a five-hour reading instructional aid who will work with students in both seventh and eighth grade and two five-hour math instructional aides uh, who would split between grades seven and eight to support those students. Um, the decisions made around these particular decisions have come uh, about through discussions with building principals as they have identified what they believe will be most beneficial to their buildings. The additional uh, time in terms of the assistance uh, being given at Eagleville is directly related to the school's position as having the highest percentage of students uh, qualifying for free and reduced lunch. At both the elementary and the middle school, the math support is especially crucial this year as we have new resources for both levels. Uh, so we expect that these IAs may be able to help qualifying students fill gaps that may exist uh, since moving to these resources. Uh, as a reminder, in our district we offer targeted assistance, uh, which means that these instructional assistants hired through the Title I funds will be working with specific students uh, in those buildings as identified through assessment data. Uh, it is unlikely that we will receive similar funding through Title I in the future. Uh, therefore, our goal this year is to feel fully utilize these human resources uh, to help better position our students for academic success in upcoming years. So those positions that Dr. Harney has, the seven uh, IAs through Title I funds, that's what that relates to. Are there any questions for Dr. Katona on the use of the new Title I funds? Just kind of a question, I guess, that goes to both you and uh, Dr. Harney. Um, any worry about trying to fill this many positions in the amount of time that we have to get these instructional assistants? I mean, that seven positions seems like a lot, but I don't know how quickly something like that could happen. I don't know the best person to, to answer that. <laughs> Yeah, the, the likelihood that we have all seven ready for next week is is slim, to be quite honest with you. We're, we're, we've posted the positions. We're going to be starting to collect uh, applications. So there's still be continued placeholders there. I don't know how that works month to month. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. But I don't see us having all of those people ready to go next week for the voting. You know, we will we, we will remove those placeholders if we're not going to have an action item for you to approve. So essentially, when we were preparing uh, this agenda for this evening, it was our intent to inform you, first of all, um, and to make sure that uh, you understood the rationale. And in the instance that we were going to be able to meet the deadline for next month or next week, um, we would have kept them on there. But um, as Dr. Honey said, it, it may change. But, but in, in our intent is to fill all those positions. 
No, thank you. And it seems like a great um, use of the resources that we have. So thank you. May, may I just also say that because um, because we'll be throughout the first couple of weeks of school really looking at you know the assessment data and doing some uh, review of where students are in their skills, you know if if they start into the middle of September so that you know that should not be an issue and we've really been looking as we've been interviewing for instructional assistance in different areas this summer we've been making note if there have been people that we thought might be good candidates for these as opposed to those other positions so hopefully we will have those <laughs> yeah I, I might have missed this but when did we find out about this Title I funding, you know, is it, is it just a process breakdown that we hear too late that we can decide what resources we may want to add? We typically, the district has typically been what I would call flat, I guess, in what it's received for Title I and Title II, certainly since I've been here and I think even before that. Um, this year, late in the spring, uh, we received I received information regarding what our funding would be. I was very surprised by the increase in it and so I took some time to do some investigating to make sure that it was in fact correct. Um, and then once that was established then you have to go through the process of planning well what you know what do you want to put into the grant what are you going to need to do at that time we were still hiring some principles and and so forth so it's you know the timing wasn't great um, but typically it's late in the spring when when we find out what we the money that we'll have but then we have to decide how we're going to expend it so does the timing normally it sounds like there hasn't been enough of variance that timing doesn't normally hinder you from doing what you need to do. So I guess we shouldn't lift a, look a gift horse in the mouth, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we, we hire staff now through uh, what would have typically been the, uh, the amount that we would receive generally. And until we did the verification, because it was such a, a larger amount than is anticipated, it, it's kind of set us back here. Any other questions on uh, for Dr. Katona? Yes. Um, just out of curiosity, why Arcola and not Skyview? Is it just because of the building population, because of needs? There, there is a formula. Actually, there are three different formulas that you can use to figure out uh, which of your buildings will qualify, and Skyview did not qualify, but Arcola did. <laughs> Any further questions? If not, we'll move on to the next item, number 12 policy. Uh, please note that there are seven policies. Those seven were added here today, uh, yes, or today uh, uh, as a result of the policy committee meeting held last evening. Um, some, of them, some of them required adjustments and uh, they are reflected in the uh, track changes version that's posted to the website. Um, so you please, uh, when you have uh, time, please review those. Again, those will be for first reading. And then also we have several policies for second reading, uh, four in fact, uh, one being the handbooks. Uh, we'll just mention handbooks real quick, if I could. Um, we, we, did, we had some discussion last evening. Again, the handbooks um, still need some additional work. Uh, we spent a lot of time today uh, building principles, working on getting the handbooks uh, aligned with each other. So for example, uh, we're just taking a different eye and a different approach to the review of handbooks that we may have not taken in, in, in such a long time. And as such, um, it's requiring some formatting to keep some consistencies. It's requiring some changes, obviously some maybe, and even some errors that, that, are being, that are being corrected. But the most important piece is uh, that we have, we have an eye to, being, to having documents that are, are parent friendly and that are consistent. So if a, if a parent has a, a child in multiple buildings, uh, they have a, a general understanding that and flow of how the uh, handbooks should should uh, should sequence. So uh, that's the work that we need to uh, complete. Um, we are due to have the final versions back to members of the policy committee for possible posting on Tuesday. For Tuesday, by I believe 
Thursday uh, of this week. So um, we still have work to do, and we want to get that accomplished. So I do want to I do want to say thank you to the policy committee uh, for being patient with the process, but it's, uh, but also being uh, thoughtful in helping us try to get this organized. Um, if there are no other questions on that, uh, we have some items under other. Uh, I will I, I will make it reflected that the uh, the actual uh, actual item under transportation schedule reflect what we're actually asking you to approve. So we'll make those changes. Um, we have dates for uh, board members' calendars, and under old business, I just want to, if if I may, just make a, a quick statement. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that I've informed the, the Finance Committee uh, that we are trying to pull together several candidates of interest to consider for the Director of Business Services. In the meantime, it is important that you know that we are currently maintaining the operation in lieu of a director or without an interim director. As you may recall, my initial assessment and recommendation to the board was to uh, uh, use an interim director as needed during the transition period. We did identify an interim uh, by the name of Michael Braun who began uh, work with us uh, as an interim process um, and whom also has been listed on the list of bills uh, for, for that fact. Um, I later determined that uh, with the task before us and the complexity associated with uh, those tasks, uh, we would be better served uh, during this period with each of us in the business office as well as myself taking on certain additional tasks to ensure that a smooth transition occurs. Uh, to date, we are taking care of the matters in a timely fashion. Um, this is without any major projects, without you know, the budgeting process in place without uh, dealing with any other financial matters like construction, et cetera. Uh, so this is, this is just a, a status quo in terms of making sure that uh, we're, we're prepared uh, to meet our students and families at the start of the school year and to be uh, operational. Uh, but I will, if in the instance that I determine that we need to engage uh, an interim until we find a permanent replacement, I'll, I will make the board aware of that. So I just wanted to make sure that there were no questions on, on uh, Mr. Braun's uh, being notified on the list of bills. Other than that, um, is there any other old business that needs to be considered? If not, uh, any new business? If no new business, courtesy of the floor. Oh, I'm sorry. Could I just make a comment? Um, I wanted to express my appreciation for seeing the goals on the front page of the agenda. I think the more that we're reminded of those, the more likely we are to achieve them. It was a good addition. Thank you. I think that was the intent uh, uh, all along. We were trying to get those goals into, uh, actually on the agenda, but technology-wise, we weren't able to do that. Um, so this is our best uh, uh, second option. But thank you for recognizing that. Um, I would like to uh, discuss this with the member himself at some point, but in the matter of transparency, I would like to bring up something. Um, the six of us on the board are new, newer after a couple months. I think we've gotten our feet wet and are jumping right in there. And I have a concern that has to the board has to probably discuss. I don't know if it's at the next work session. Um, it's also a policy issue, which I am part of the committee. There's been a lot of scheduling conflicts lately, like Mr. Roth was here for property. He had to leave. It's understandable. Um, uh, and I was looking through the board information on the website today, um, and there's one inaccuracy. It's not a big deal, but there's nine people here that give a lot of time all of which are involved in at least two committees and are committed to participating as much as possible. There is a board member. Um, it's listed that he is a committee chair. He is not on any committees. And I'm worried about his attendance and his participation. So I just would, and I would like to have spoken to him privately, but he's not here. So I would like to address that because there's a lot of important decisions coming up and that have been obviously and it concerns me a great deal. Is, is the inaccuracy listed on our website under the board? Okay, well, I'll, I'll make sure that's taken care of. I mean, I, I just want to be accurate with, with the information. Right. And at some point, um, policy and or uh, the president needs to have a conversation with this board member because there's too many important things going on and we need nine committed people. 
and to be a board member, apparently, prior policy, your job is you just can't miss two voting meetings. And I know we can't pigeonhole nine volunteers, so sometimes we're going to miss things. I missed policy yesterday, I feel terrible about it, but I had to go to the vote tech meeting. So when we don't have a board member participating, it affects the board as a whole and it could affect the district. Are there any other new business items? And courtesy of the floor. Good evening, everyone. If you remember, I'm Charles Falco. I live in Lower Providence. I also work for First Student and did work for Methacton. I'm also the chief shop steward for all the members down there. I'd like to point out, I'd like to thank the district and Bob Shock for the cooperation in involving the drivers. I think it was an invaluable lesson we've learned as a district that if you involve the people that actually do the work, you get some good knowledge out of it. And I want to thank Bob. He was very healthy. He listened to everything we, we gave him, and they did make the changes. The only problem I had with any of it was it came late. I got back from vacation July 1st. It was the board meeting after that. It got brought up, and it finally got taken care of mid-July. It was kind of late to start routing runs. Well, that's why they're late now. We were supposed to bid our runs this Thursday. We're supposed to have five days to review our runs. They're not right. The PM runs aren't right. The AM runs are pretty much intact. It's the PM runs. Now I got senior drivers here. I'm a senior driver. I got oh, 90 or 100 drivers to deal with, all of which bid by seniority. It affects their paycheck. We need to know and have time to view this. So in the future, my only suggestion is that, that involve us again. We'll gladly help. We're there to help our students and to help the district. We want to get involved. We want to give you our knowledge of the district. Instead of waiting to July, this should have been done in April and May. And it just would have made the transition a lot easier. Instead of now us having these runs somewhat finalized tomorrow, which gives people maybe a few hours to go look at their run that they may bid on, we could have our five days. And that's all we, that's all we want. It's not really that much to ask. The other things to point out, such as uh, oh, uh, three students to a seat, we know in kindergarten and in first to fourth grade that that happens. But I can just say this, being one of those drivers, when kids get on the bus, they go where they want to go. We have rules where we say, okay, kindergartners have to sit in the first three seats, and first graders and second graders and fourth graders or whatever sit in whatever in the back. But if they sit together from the very beginning of the run, three to a seat, and they're fine, as a driver, I'm not going to say nothing to them. I'm not going to say, no, you've got to make room, you know, make, you know, spread out a little bit. They're fine. If they're on the bus for 40 minutes that way and they're happy, that makes me happy. <laughs> so, and as far as like I heard someone mention about kindergarten runs, well, I have two drivers over here to do kindergarten runs. I do a kindergarten run. That's a midday run. We also have kindergartners that get on in the afternoon and go home in the evening because of the AM and PM kindergartners. The only reason they have a reason to be on that bus any length of time is because you're picking them up maybe first in your run because that's the way the run's set up. There's no way of getting them later because of maybe, the, especially like in the Worcester area. It's almost impossible to double back in the Worcester area. It's just too big of an area to cover. So just things like that, but I really want to emphasize my thanks for involving us. It made me feel good, and I'm sure the drivers that all helped out were happy to see with Bob. I mean, he was great. I, I can't emphasize enough how he listened to us. It wasn't like you, you felt like you were just saying something, you go, yeah, 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 and blow it off. You know, he personally came up to me, let me know, Charlie, we made all your changes you did, and I think I did personally 40 routes. So, uh, and I have other drivers that were here that did something like, you know, nine and 10 in one day. You know, just to help the district out. And I thank you drivers for coming and helping me out and helping Bob out and helping the district out. And I want to thank you all. Thank you. And as a, a parent in Worcester of those kindergarten kids getting on 45, 50 minutes, 
when my kids did it, I liked it because I got to go to work earlier. So, <laughs> and they liked it because they got to spend more time with their friends on the bus. So, and in that, you get, you get an argument. Susanna, are you disagreeing with that? <laughs> okay. Well, my daughter has a different opinion than me, well, which I'm is. <laughs> John Andrews, Lower Providence. Uh, I'm not expecting to be here next week, uh, vacation. Uh, on the list of bills, uh, there is a payment to District Management Council for High School Scheduling Service of 20000 I think that's the, the Massachusetts group. Uh, I, I'm kind of surprised that I haven't heard that the work has begun and already they want payment for the work. I would think if their deliverable comes in November, that kind of an item should be on the list of bills around that time rather than many months ahead. I mean, you've authorized the work, but uh, you know, why pay for it before it's done? Uh, and uh, one of your executive sessions uh, was relative to uh, the next agreement with the uh, professional staff and uh, specifically uh, a lot of Farina people who get $1,000 of uh, medical deductibles uh, as part of the package. And uh, I, I, th I think that uh, <clears throat> these people get decent pay and they ought to have some uh, responsibility, financial responsibility for their, for their health. It shouldn't be a hundred percent on our tab. Uh, so, uh, you know, maybe the thousand dollars next year, at the first year of that new agreement, it's 500 and then it's eliminated after that. Uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, scattergrams that was presented last month uh, uh, mentioned that uh, at the visitation uh, parochial school that the number of buses would be cut from five to four and uh, some of the students would be on those buses for 70 minutes and I, I, I fail to see where the, the goal is to get the public school students down to 50 minutes why the uh, uh, parochial stu school students uh, uh, may get to be on the bus for 70 minutes. Uh, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, relative to the uh, board approval requirements for routes and stops. It's my understanding, and, and this can be checked, that school code requires that the bus stops be approved by the board. And I know of quite a few years that that was the case uh, uh, in, in, here in Methacton. But my recollection of the school code is that it, it does not require board approval of the actual routes. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, perhaps you approve the parameters resolution for the for the uh, busing uh, at a at a soon to be held meeting, and then uh, maybe come October you approve the uh, the uh, bus stops uh, if indeed it's required by school code. And uh, regarding last night's policy committee meeting, uh, one policy related to uh, board meetings, and it spoke about uh, uh, members uh, need a good excuse if they miss two consecutive regular meetings. Uh, regular meetings is not defined. Uh, what the board has, of course, is working sessions and voting meetings. and. In my mind, those are both regular meetings. So there's some basic clarification there needed. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, someone who uh, chooses to say they're a school director and comes to just uh, six voting meetings a year is uh, not doing any of us any favors, and they're themselves included. Thank you.
Joe Bickelman, Audubon. It's hard to believe Bob Schock was a business manager, too. How about that, huh? Um, regarding the hours, if, if my, my wife had an AM and PM run and a noonday kindergarten last year, she averaged 36 hours a week. Uh, we went through the runs. We couldn't find one for 28 hours a week, AM, PM, noonday kindergarten. Couldn't find a, one for, you know, it's like eight hours less. And for every hour less a week, she earns $1,000 less a year. So that's a salary adjustment to her. I mean, she'll have to scramble around and get other hours, maybe grab a work study. She's eighth in seniority. So I'm telling you about somebody that's an eighth in seniority that's picking that can't find AM, PM, and noonday kindergarten more than 28 hours. And she did this job for 36 hours last year. And the medical premiums are going to go up, too. Just to let you know that. So, plus there's going to be a significant reduction in buses. That narrows it down, I guess, to maybe 10, 8 to 10 less, less buses. But we have, we have the union fighting for, for that stuff. Um, so it's going to be an adjustment in our household and probably the other driver's households too, because I don't think there's going to be enough work studies to go around and enough trips and things like that. Plus, if you do a trip on the side that doesn't involve students, you get paid uh, what they call a, a drop-down rate. They get paid a lot less than their regular rate. So for my wife, it's probably anywhere eight hours, around eight hours less. She's going to have to grab other hours. So the district wins less buses. First student wins, paying less hours. The district doesn't have to pay in excess of four hours for the runs. I understand they pay more if it's four hours or uh, greater than four hours. So everybody wins, except, except the drivers again. It's a shame. It really is a shame. Um, Bob Schock was hired as the transportation consultant without public discussion at the board level. Uh, he's very good at what he does, but there was no discussion at the board level before he was hired. I found out he was doing the work, you know, through the grapevine, and I asked Dr. Uh, Zerby how much we were paying him, and Dr. Zerby said $5,000. And by the looks of it, to get this guy for eight to 10 months, that's, that's a bargain, $5,000. So, I also have a question about the AEM report, and Brenda Hackett alluded to it. Mr. Leinbach stood up here and said that that document was the final report, that there wasn't going to be any updates to that booklet. But you said it's a draft, the chair. Is it a draft? Leinbach said it was final. It was the document. There wasn't going to be any changes to that document. And who's, who's, who's right, Mr. Leinbach or the committee? It's something I sit there and I just watch and I, and I go, this guy's saying it's a final report. The guy that did the report, he said there's no changes coming. But you're saying it's a draft. Is it a draft or a final report? It's a draft, so there'll be changes. There'll be red line changes to it. Okay, I can't wait to see those. Uh, and it's amazing how the federal uh, dollars went up for Title I in an election year. I know the number of qualifying students didn't go up that great. It's just the money being thrown at, at the school districts across the country, probably. And it happens at the state level here, and probably happens at the federal level. So it's an election year, so that's why there's a lot more money coming. Hopefully it's funded as we go through the years, and we don't have to pick up the cost of the aides as the funding might drop off. All right, thank you. Candy Alaba, Eagleville. Um, this 20% reduction in, in travel time on the buses, is that guaranteed? Or is that a figure that the school district is shooting for to reduce the ride time by 20%? Because I've lived here a long time. And one thing people need to understand, if there's an accident on 422, Lower Providence becomes a mess 
because everybody gets off 422, comes into Lower Providence, there's the traffic, and I've watched school buses sit in traffic. I don't like the fact that the bus drivers are on the hook if their buses come in late. That's not their fault. I mean, you have a bus program that is being fed information from a human. That is artificial. The reality is the traffic in this township has gotten exceedingly worse over the years, and it's not from the people that live here. It's from the pass-through traffic. And to bring up, it takes longer to put special needs students on the bus. I was a little offended by that because I had a family member who was special needs, and it took him 15 minutes to get on the bus because he had cerebral palsy and he didn't have a wheelchair. That is something that really is a given. It doesn't need to be brought up. But the fact is, we're going in there a third year of first student, and I have heard more about the bus drivers and transportation in the last three years than I've heard in 20. When Methacton ran their own bus service, we were well known for having a great bus service, a transportation service in this area. And for the last three years, I've heard complaints. You're sending out letters on August the 22nd. For years, I've heard parents complain, we can't start school early because last week's August, the parents go on vacation. Who's going to be home to see these letters on August 22nd? If they go away on vacation. And then your call center is only going to be two weeks after school starts. Last year, there were still complaints into November. And the complaints weren't getting answered. Now, from what I see in the agenda that Mr. Laws has resigned and you have a separation agreement, is the public going to be made aware it was in that separation agreement? Because there's been constant complaints about Mr. Laws. But I don't see the transportation problem being fixed. You're putting Band-Aids on it. It has got continuously worse. And I don't have a horse in this race. My kids are gone. They were in the school district when transportation was great. There was a problem. A phone call was made. It was handled immediately. But the fact is, I'm a taxpayer. And at some point, this is going to cost us money. More money. This was supposed to be moved to save us money. I don't see the savings. I think the Title I program is great. But my only question is, when the federal money runs out, how much is it going to cost us taxpayers to pick up the slack, like we did with the SRO? We started out with a grant, and over the years, it's cost us more money. And now, we think we need an SRO. I mean, it's, we're spending all this money. We're bringing in more teachers. We're cutting the bus runs. We have less kids, but we're spending more money. So I, I don't. Maybe I just don't get the mathematics, but something's out of whack here. But I don't understand why all of a sudden there's problems with our bus routing and our bus stops, when for years there was no. We had qualified, respected, professional bus drivers in this school district, and we're losing them. And I really don't want to see the board come back and vote to lay off any bus drivers. That I don't want to see. Because we've lost lunch people, we've lost bus drivers. I don't want to see any more lost. And the kids in this school district have ridden on the buses for a long time. If you look at where they live and where the schools are posted. Methacton High School, the kids that live all the way at the other end of Lower Providence, and Worcester are going to ride that long. If they live at the end of Pauling's Road, that is a long ride in a car to the high school. The kids that go to Skyview and Arcola, the main, the main argument about Skyview was the length of time those children had to ride to the Arcola campus. And that was 10 years ago. And it's got worse. The ride time's got worse. So these are things you have to look at, but I have to agree with the gentleman that said, we're talking a bit about it now when this should have been discussed in the spring and being rushed through, which in this school district will create a mountain of problems come the beginning of school. And you're going to be dealing with the emails and the phone calls. So I wish you a lot of luck on that, but you need to, <laughs> you need to inform the parents now that they're going to be getting these letters instead of coming home Labor Day and seeing a letter in the mail. So thank you.
Uh, sounds like you're going to have an executive session with your daughter when you get home. Uh, <laughs> it's already been in the public, so. Uh, motion to adjourn the meeting. Second, everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate it.